All right, hey AP Chemists, this is gonna be our last video of unit one. This is unit one, important information part eight. I know it says part four, but that's old. Um, this will be about periodic trends and ions. So we're gonna start putting together what we should predict as far as comparing and looking at properties of atoms and tie it back to Z effective. <clears throat> so the first thing that we're gonna look at, and in these notes, I kind of have answers kind of all spread out to kind of make this video a little bit shorter and have me write less for your benefit. So you could feel free to pause or copy whenever you can. So the first thing we'll look at is atomic radii. Um, atomic radii refers to just the size of the atom. You don't have to worry about reading all that fun stuff. The size is going to be dependent on two important things, the number of electrons. And as you can see, I drew a little, a little like fake Bohr model here, the number of electrons, and you'll see more electrons, it'll probably be larger. And then Z effective, the greater the Z effective, the smaller it'll be. Greater Z effective, greater the attraction, and it'll be smaller. Okay, so as you can see, I have a little periodic table here that has the size of atoms, we could try and see which our largest atom is and it looks like cesium is our largest in the bottom left. We, do, we could also try and see what our smallest atom is. It looks like helium is our smallest. And if I wanted to identify a trend, it looks like I'm going from bottom left to top right, or from uh, top to bottom, I'm gonna increase. And also from right to left, I'm gonna increase in size. Overall, the further away from fluorine, the larger I'll be. So I could kind of do like a little dotted line here and say, increase in size. This is going to be helpful for you to remember which atom is larger, but the why is going to be a whole different ball game, right? So it's going to be very important that you know that cesium is one of the largest atoms, but you can't just say because it's in group one or in the far left, cannot say that the elements don't know where they are on the periodic table. So why do we expect this trend or crossroads? The answer will always be having to do with Z effective, effective nuclear charge. And I kind of have the explanation kind of written out here. As we move to the right uh, in a row, so as we go from left to right, the effective nuclear charge increases. And so the Z effective experienced by the electrons in the outermost shell increases and thus there's greater attractions and it's going to be a smaller radii. So if I have something like fluorine, which has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, fluorine with nine protons versus lithium with only, sorry, I shouldn't put lithium, lithium with only three protons, three protons, the lithium will probably be a little bit larger because it has a, so it's gonna be larger, or the nine plus is gonna be smaller, because lithium has a smaller effective nuclear charge, electrons will be hanging out more, or because of the larger Z effective, as we mentioned here, the atom will be smaller. Those electrons on the outermost shell will be really attracted to that nucleus. Now, why do we expect this trend down a column? We did this in earlier notes. As you go down, the number of shells or energy levels increases. So if you had like lithium, you'd have then lithium and then sodium, and then it would just get larger and larger. More shells, larger. You could also just say more electrons. Um, but there's also more shielding, so a weaker is the effective. So sodium has more shielding and thus a smaller Z effective for the outer electron. So the smaller the Z effective, the larger it'll be. And that's actually why cesium will be the largest because cesium will probably have the weakest C effective out of all those elements there. And the electrons are going to, and there's going to be more and more electrons that are just going to be spread further apart. All right, so let's talk a little bit about ions now and ionic radii. So I wanted to first talk about like writing electron configurations for ions. You actually kind of already did something like this in class, but I wanted to zoom in a little bit more. From our summer work, 
we saw and we calculated how to figure out how many protons, electrons, and neutrons are in atoms. To remind you, our charge is equal to the number of protons minus the number of electrons. For a neutral atom, that's zero. Doesn't that make sense? Because for a neutral atom, the protons are equal to electrons. For a neutral atom of magnesium, there's 12 protons and 12 electrons. But for a magnesium ion, it looks like there's two plus. That means I lost two electrons. That's one way of thinking about it. Or if you can't think about gaining and losing the electrons of the original atom, protons, the number of protons minus the charge is equal to the number of electrons. So with my charge being plus 2 and my protons were 12, 12 minus plus 2, 10. So I have 10 electrons for magnesium. Now, I'm going to do the orbital diagram and electron configuration for a magnesium with 12 electrons. I'll just do it very quickly. 1s2, that's 2 of electrons. That's 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Electron configuration, as we've seen so many times, for the magnesium atom is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2. From a previous lecture, we could identify that this 3, oops, I didn't mean to erase, that this 3s2 is known as the valence shell. There are two valence shells electrons. We discussed this in our last lecture about valence electrons, and we talked about um, that the group number is equal to valence electrons, so I'm going to bring it back and tie it back here. If I were to write the electron configuration with something with 10 electrons, or the magnesium 2 plus add, uh, ion, if I only have 10 electrons, it'd be 1s2, so it's 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Look at this, it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, done. This is the electronic configuration for the magnesium 2 plus ion. Notice how I no longer have that 3s. I remove electrons. I removed electrons from the valence, which is the 3s sublevel there. Now, the electrons will be re removed first. They require the least amount of energy. We call those the valence electrons. Again, vocab again, we've seen this. The valence, sorry, the valence electrons are the electrons in the outermost shell. Why do these electrons require the least amount of energy? Back to the effective and Coulomb's law. They are the furthest away from the nucleus. And so they would experience a weaker, experience a lower or weaker Z effective not attracted as much. And so those could easily fall off. So that would be a good explanation, like AP style explanation for later. So if you have to explain why maybe the 3S is removed and not the 2P, these 2p electrons, or the 2s and the 1s, these are core electrons, and I'm going to highlight them in red. These are core electrons. They require lots of energy. I'm going to say more energy. And we saw that in our previous lecture, okay? All right, let's just do another example, writing electron configuration for the chloride ion. Well, I already wrote chlorine. We did that in our previous lecture, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p5. This has 17 electrons. The chloride ion looks like it gained one electron. Or if I were to do the math, um, as up here, proton, the protons minus charge. So this protons minus the charge, minus negative one right? You have to use the charge, plus or minus. Minus negative 1, 18 electrons. And so I'm going to just do 18 electrons. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. That would be 18 electrons. And I'm going to highlight where I put them. I put one more in the 3p. Overall, the 3s and the 3p would be considered my valence electrons. Now chlorine has eight valence electrons. Now it has eight valence. Sorry, that should say eight elect in valence. Before, only seven 
valence electrons. Now, note on the AP exam elements with exceptions of the off bow principle, and this was, I've talked to some of you about that, they're not required. So you're going to see that some of these, like chromium or molybdenum, they might have like 4s1, 3d10, or 4s1, 3d5. This is not required for the AP exam. So if you see anything like this, like in your looking up and research, don't worry about it. All right, so this was just a little crash like writing ions. All right, now ionic radii have some more information here for us. Um, the size of an atom when it becomes a cation ion depends on the electrons, right? So metals tend to lose electrons and will become smaller. Non-metals tend to gain electrons and become larger. So more electrons gained, larger in size. So like fluoride ion versus the nitride ion. Nitride gained three electrons versus fluoride only one. More electrons lost the smaller the size, so like calcium 2 plus versus potassium 2 plus. Look at calcium 2 plus, it's 100, but K plus is 138. Calcium 2 plus is smaller because it lost two electrons and it also will have like a greater nuclear charge. Um, but if you look at N3 minus, it's going to be larger because it gained more electrons. So a little bit of a thing here. I did draw some arrows on here. You can try and come up with your own little trend. It's going to be hard to kind of identify a trend, but overall, our metals will end up being smaller than their previous. So look at this one. Sodium atom to sodium ion, it's smaller. Potassium atom to potassium ion, it's smaller. But fluorine atom to fluorine ion or fluoride ion is larger. Look, it's negative. Calcium atom to calcium ion, that's smaller. So just showing you some things here. Now it says PM. I put PM. PM is typically the size we use of these atoms. This is just like another conversion factor. PM is picometer, which is 10 to the minus 12 meter or 10 to the 12 picometer is one meter. So just like a, another conversion for you. But anyways, this is important for us to know if you had to predict sizes, you'd have to think about electrons and effective nuclear charge. Look at maybe even calcium ion and calcium atom versus potassium ion and potassium atom. Think about why the calcium atom would be smaller. Sorry, think about why the calcium ion would be smaller than the potassium ion. This has a smaller Z effective, so it'll be larger in size. This has a larger Z effective, so it'll be smaller in size. See how that's pretty consistent? Ever, if you ever have to explain why something is bigger or smaller, you're really going to have to look at Z effective. I'm hoping I, I, I've got that point across here. The answer to the why right here, look at my highlighting. I'm going to go back a page. The answer to the why will always have to do with Z effective and Coulomb's law. Why is this? Why does it look like that? Why would we predict this? It has to do with Z effective. All right, getting to some more little properties here. I already have the definition here, but electronegativity, this is going to be so important for unit two and three. A nice little, very important property. Um, electronegativity is another property. It's the attraction an element has for electrons. We're going to see that the greater the Z effective, the greater the electronegativity because the greater the attraction, right? If it has more protons or a greater effective nuclear charge, it's going to attract electrons more. And this is a table of electronegativity values. You could see that the smallest is cesium. It's also the largest atom. Largest, I'm not going to write them there. But you can see that cesium, which is also like the largest atom, is the smallest electronegativity, where fluorine, which is one of the smallest atoms, is going to be the largest electronegativity. It looks like electronegativity is going to increase as you go from bottom to top and then from left to right. So I'm going to say increase in, I'm going to use EN for electronegativity, just to kind of shorthand. And from bottom to top, I'm going to increase in electronegativity. Overall, it looks like the closer we are to fluorine, increase in electronegativity, the closer we are to fluorine, closer to fluorine, the more electronegative you are. And that is because fluorine is the most electronegative element. Most 
electronegative element O M G know this. I'll probably ask this in the future. You'll have to know this. I'll probably throw it out in class and I'll say which element is the most electronegative and you'll have to talk about fluorine. It's got a really good Z effective, really strong Z effective. All right, another property, and this will be our last one that we're really focusing on, is ionization energy. We've talked about this a bunch. Um, it's the amount of energy required to move an electron. Know how to write a schematic. I've seen on the AP exam, like even last year, where it's like write an, an, an equation for ionization energy. Well, it's the uh, required to remove an electron. It's the energy required to remove an electron. So if I have some atom... To write the schematic, I'm going to write X. It's going to become an ion because it's going to lose loss of one electron. And I'll play plus one. And then um, another way that I'll probably also put it is X plus some energy kilojoules per mole. All right, so I add some energy and I become the X plus ion plus one electron. This is a schematic for writing an ionization energy. So if I had to do it for, let's just say I was doing it for lithium. Lithium's ionization energy schematic. It would look like this. I would write lithium plus some energy, right? I'm adding energy to remove an electron and I would become Li plus plus one electron, done. And then look at our trends here. Our trends make sense with Z effective. Look at what element has the highest um, ionization energy. Can you find it? <laughs> um, this is kind of like Dora the Explorer here. But it's looking like it's over here by like helium or neon or fluorine. The highest ionization energies are over here. And maybe you would have guessed it, the lowest ionization energies are down here. This trend is very similar to Z effective and and electronegativity as you go from uh as you go from bottom to top there's an increase in ionization energy and as you go from left to right oops i just wrote over that as you go from left to right there's going to be an increase in ionization energy and so from bottom left to top right or the closer you are to get to fluorine there's an increase in ionization energy. And if you had to explain why, why would fluorine's ionization first, or why would fluorine's ionization energy be higher than calcium? You would talk about effective nuclear charge, electronegativity, all that fun stuff. I'm just gonna briefly talk about it, but not even really. There's something called electron affinity. This is more in college. It's the opposite of electronegativity. It's the energy required to add an electron to a neutral atom. It's not really tested, but just in case, here's the schematic. If I add an electron to an atom, how much energy comes out would be the schematic of electron affinity. Not really going to talk about it too much. I'm going to end here with bridging the gap between unit one and unit two. This might be a little bit of a longer video, um, but bridging the gap between unit one and unit two is periodic properties. It's very important to know that elements in the same group will behave and react similarly. This is because elements in the same group will have the same number of valence electrons. We already know that. But there, this is the reason why. Why, think, why lithium will behave like sodium. Why phosphorus will behave like arsenic. So here are some questions that you're going to have to be able to answer in the future. What element will react and behave like rubidium, which is right here? Well, rubidium is in group one, so you could say any group one element. So examples of any group one element would be hydrogen or lithium or sodium, potassium. Right, that would answer that question. What element will react and behave like rubidium? Here's another one. What element will form the same charge as calcium? Right, behave like calcium. Calcium's in group two, so any group two element so beryllium, magnesium, strontium, dot, 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 dot. Um, and then finally, our last question here. If cesium forms a compound in a 1 to 3 ratio with nitrogen, meaning CSN3, sorry, that should be CS, CS3N, 
because cesium typically forms a plus one and nitrogen is minus three. What is another element that cesium will form a one to three ratio with? Well, I want something else that will behave like nitrogen. That's what it's asking. If cesium forms a compound in a one to three ratio with nitrogen, what's another element like nitrogen that cesium will form a one to three ratio with? Well, anything in group five. Nitrogen is in group five. So phosphorus, arsenic, antimony, bismuth, dot, 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 dot. So that's a quick little bridging the gap between unit one and unit two. Knowing about our periodic property and valence electrons, elements in the same group will behave similarly because of the number of valence electrons. And now, as evidence for your understanding and ending this unit here, there are seven AP-style multiple-choice questions. I'm going to call them AP-style problems that I'd like you to be able to do. And then there are two free response questions AP-style that I'd like you to be able to do. That is all for Unit 1. This might have been a little bit longer, but it ties together all things that we've learned in Unit 1. If you have any questions or concerns, feel free to reach out and make sure you know this for the end of our unit before we move to Unit 2.